Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilt, and I'd like to thank Dr. de Blasi for inviting me to give this presentation on a type of romance novel cover that was popular in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, known as the clinch cover. I have created a PowerPoint presentation um, that will guide us through this presentation. So I'm just gonna take a minute and share my screen. And I know PowerPoint is a little old school, but that actually fits with the topic um, because I'm a little old school and these um, uh, romance novel covers are old school as well. So it should all work. All right, here we go. So as I said, my name is Jennifer Wilt. I live in central upstate New York. Um, I am, as, as a profession, I'm a school librarian, but I'm also a writer. I'm working on a novel. It's a, a mystery literary hybrid. And uh, my website, which I have included here, is dedicated to, uh, to my writing and to some of my other uh, pursuits as well. Um, and additionally, I have a small business selling collectible books, mostly online. Um, and that's where my interest in vintage romances comes in. Um, I am not a specialist in romance. My interest is more peripheral and it is connected to the collectible books and also to the fact that um, I read a lot of these romances when I was younger. And I think the covers, the clinch covers are just a lot of fun. And so I've sort of developed an interest and a knowledge based on my own curiosity. So if you were interested in learning more about me, you're welcome to visit my website. Um, you can certainly contact me through my email, jennifer at jenniferwilt.com. And of course, you're more than welcome to connect with me on Twitter. And my Twitter account is Art of the Clinch. This is where I met Dr. de Blasi and a lot of other wonderful people in the romance community, um, the collectible book community. Um, so it's a, a very lively uh, Twitter feed, Twitter community that I have with this account. This is a screenshot of, of the account. I actually uh, joined with this account in 2017. However, at that time, it was not uh, Daily Clinch, Art of the Clinch, had nothing to do with uh, romance covers or even books. I started the account with the idea that I would use it for my business, um, but it didn't go anywhere. So the account sort of languished. I think I had maybe five, <laughs> five followers. Maybe I was following 20 people. I do have another Twitter account under my actual name, um, which I used much more often. But over the past year, I became very disillusioned with Twitter. It seems as though um, there was always argument, or the polarization, the political polarization, the stress around the COVID-19. So I had become very disillusioned and thought, well, you know, maybe I just won't be able to find joy in Twitter anymore. And one day, and I don't even know what spurred it, I just got the idea to retrofit this particular account, make it all about uh, vintage romance covers, clinch covers. Um, and that's what I did. And it became uh, a hit pretty quickly. And I'm enjoying it. I tweet approximately two book covers a day. Um, sometimes there's conversation around them people remember reading them, or there might be something particularly interesting or outrageous about the cover. Um, and so it's just, it, it, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way for me to enjoy Twitter again. All right, let's start talking about the covers. So first of all, what is a clinch? 
when I first started the account, I didn't realize that people didn't actually know what a clinch was. So I pinned an article to the top of uh, my Twitter feed um, that explains it. Um, and you're certainly welcome to read that, but I can also give you a brief description. It was a term that those in the publishing industry uh, sort of coined in the late 70s, early 80s, and it specifically meant the kinds of poses that you see on these covers. So a clinch is always going to include two people. Um, and in the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was usually, well, not usually, it was always a man and a woman. And they are in some type of an embrace. They're usually swooning. They usually have expressions of ecstasy or sort of um, aroused anger on their faces. A lot of times their shirts are off or they're coming off or other body parts are exposed. Here we have some leg going on. Um, always, almost always we have the low, <laughs> the low necklines. Um, and these were sort of over the top. Um, some people thought they were embarrassing. Some people loved them. Some people hated them. But the bottom line is they sold books and they signaled to readers who were wondering, well, what's this book about? It signaled what type of content there would be. There would be a love story. There would be explicit um, sex on the page. This was a way of signaling the content. So the clinch was pretty much the standard um, throughout this time. In the 70s, it was the, the genre was still getting um, sort of established. The very, very first book of this type was published in 1972 called The Flame and the Flower by Kathleen Woodweiss. Um, and this was the very first of the big historical romances that had explicit sex. Prior to this, there were romances, but they were what you would call closed door um, for anything involving intimacy. And they were not usually quite as big. They usually were in series or in category. So this was a new, a new pathway, a new avenue for romance. So in the 70s, um, you had the smaller clinch, as you see here on the cover of Captive Bride. In fact, the flame and the flower, when it first came out, it had a very, very small cameo of the couple on the cover. Um, and as the 70s went on, you started having more of this type of thing. But it wasn't really until um, the late 70s, early 80s, that the full page clinch uh, became the standard. Um, full color, vivid color. Another hallmark of the clinch was you had these um, titles with embossed, uh, flowing, looping um, lettering, vivid colors. These uh, covers that I'm sharing on this screen uh, go from the 70s through the early 2000s. So this was the earliest example um, in the 70s. Then we have the 80s into the 90s. And you can see there is sort of a progression of style. In the late 90s, early 2000s, it went from the illustrations being painted by the freelance illustrators to a lot of digital art. So that was a real transition. And you can see there's a difference in, in the look of the covers. Many of, um, of the illustrators in the 80s were told that they had to switch to the digital simply because the look was old fashioned and it was starting to go out of style. And uh, several of them felt that that was not what they wanted to do or they felt bad about it. Some of them went ahead and adapted to the, to the digital 
but many of them were at their peak uh, in these painted illustrations. So the adjective used to describe these, the style of what we see here in the clinch is camp or campy. You might say they're campy um, styles of artwork, which essentially means exaggerated, over the top, um, taken to a height of ridiculousness that's just so out there that it's wonderful. So when, when the term campy is used to describe romance novels, it's generally done um, with fondness. Uh, there's a lot of nostalgia about them. People enjoy them now in a way that they sort of outgrew in the 80s. They became um, embarrassing, they became a cliche, but there's been a real resurgence in interest in them now. Um, and it's usually, the appreciation is usually based on the fact that they're campy. All right, let me check my notes and make sure I've covered everything I wanted to. Oh, the goal of my Twitter account, I didn't mention. Um, I was at first was thinking, well, I'm going to use it to maybe be educational, to put out facts about early romance. And then I decided, no, I really want it to be about just fun, because I feel as though that's a lot of times what Twitter lacks. There's so much um, argument and strife. It'll just be about the fun of it, the pleasure of enjoying the covers, sometimes making fun of them, um, sharing memories of reading them. All right. Okay, so there are other types of art that have some of the elements that we see in clinch covers. I um, mean, I just thought I'd briefly um, share some connections. So here we have um, a statue by Bernini, the Estasy of St. Teresa. So this is, as we can see her expression is very identical to some of the expressions we see on heroines on romance novel covers from the era I've been talking about. You have the swooning, um, the eyes closed, the ecstasy. In the story of St. Teresa, evidently, she had a, an, an experience in which she recounts that she was penetrated by an arrow. I believe it was from God, it actually went into her heart. And she experienced that as a union with God. So it was, it was both painful and ecstatic at the same time. Um, and she was overcome. And we can see that in her expression here. And in fact, in the early days when they were coining the term clinch, they referenced St. Teresa as, um, as that look, that expression, was something that, that you see in some of these uh, heroines. So um, in this case, we don't call it campy for whatever reason, this sort of over the top experience of spiritual ecstasy, but there you have it. That's just an interesting connection. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else is has done any serious work looking at these elements in, uh, in spiritual are. I don't know if it is in other um, spiritual traditions. I know in, in Christian um, art, you see these, these kinds of things. I'm also going to go out onto the web now and show you some cemetery sculptures that also have some similar, some similar uh, themes going on. I just have to remember to share the screen. So give me a moment. I couldn't put these pictures into my PowerPoint simply because I didn't, they're not rights cleared, number one, and I didn't have the opportunity to get in touch with the artist. He's a photographer of cemetery sculpture. He is a friend of mine. His name's Frank Caladonna. Um, so to respect copyright, instead of putting the images into the PowerPoint, I'll take you to the web where you can see them. This uh, photo of St. Teresa, is rights cleared. Any of the photos that are on this PowerPoint are either my photos, they're rights cleared, or I got permission to use them. 
All right, give me just a moment to get this going. I'm going to, I have to stop sharing the screen momentarily so that I can share the internet screen. Here we go. All right, so here is um, an image from a gravestone that shows essentially what is a clinch, I believe. Although instead of a man, we have an angel here. But the, the theme, the expression, the, even the falling away of clothing is very similar to what we see on the clinch covers. So it sort of raises the question, are there similarities between um, surrender, spiritual surrender, dying, joining with God, having these ecstatic spiritual experiences and the experience, the over the top rendering of the experience of sexual passion and falling in love. Um, I think there are, it's, a, it's a, an interesting connection. Okay, so one more I will show you, give me just a moment. One more cemetery sculpture that happens to be one of my favorites. So I have to share the screen again. Okay. Oh, here we go. All right. So this particular um, gravestone is, I believe, in Rochester, New York. And Frank Caladonna again took this photo and I just thought it was so lovely. And I also enjoy exploring cemetery. So I purchased this print from him. Um, but again, I wasn't comfortable showing it without getting his permission. Um, so this is from a press release when he had an art opening um, in the area. So again, you have the swooning uh, woman and the angel essentially, and they are in a clinch. So make of that what you will, the connection between death, spiritual surrender. And a lot of times in the romance novels, you'll have words in the titles like um, surrender or, um, well, surrender is the big one. Surrender is the big word. Um, in spirituality, you have themes of losing, losing a sense of yourself, being over, being overcome, joining union with the divine. Um, and in romantic love, sexual love, those those themes are evident as well. All right. Going back to the PowerPoint. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, here we go. And then we also have clinch-like themes in fine art as well. Here we have um, some images from fine art. We have Rodin's The Kiss. We have Klimt's The Kiss. And then I also had to include our yin and yang symbol, which is again, you have the union of the opposites, which is also a theme in, in clinches as well. So there's a, a great tradition of this type of art, but only in the context of these of the romance novel covers is this sort of a theme um, considered camp. And it could be because of the context. There could be all kinds of reasons for that. Um, but I think it's interesting to contemplate. So I wanted to include it in this presentation. All right, let's start talking about some of the, the major illustrators um, who were working in this time and who were the, um, the driving force behind, behind the look and the uh, illustrations. I'm gonna be covering several of the major illustrators, but this is by no means comprehensive. There will be some wonderful illustrators that I'm not covering, 
there were also a lot of illustrators who were never completely identified. They didn't necessarily want to be known. Um, they This was a way for them to make a living, um, but they didn't necessarily want to be associated with these kinds of, of covers, which is a whole other interesting angle. Um, but there are several here who are very well known and we can talk about them. All right, so our first one is H. Tom Hall. Tom Hall um, probably was at his uh, most prolific in the um, mid to late 70s and early 80s. This cover right here, Shanna, um, was published in 1977 and is probably the first, the first full cover clinch. So prior to this, you had the little clinches like the one I showed you in the previous slide where the couple were more cameo sized. Um, but here we're starting to see all of the elements that became associated with the clinch going forward. You have the vivid colors, you have the flowing swirling script, floating flowers, big element of clinch covers. Lots of them have the, the, the floating flowers. And then you have, of course, your couple, um, shirtless, clothing falling off, um, ecstatic expressions. Um, so all the elements right there. Um, this is what we call a step back. So you see there's no title on this. This would be um, the, the illustration right underneath the front cover of the book. So this became going into the later 80s and 90s, you had a lot of the step backs and it sort of functioned as a way um, for readers to enjoy the clinches, which they obviously did. At the same time, they might've been a little embarrassed to be seen with them reading in public. So the step back was a way to, to have their cake and eat it too, so to speak. They could be saved the embarrassment of being seen with the clinch and yet still uh, have it there to be enjoyed. A couple words about A Rose in Winter. This again, um, illustrated by Tom Hall. This was the first romance novel of this type that I ever read. It came out in 1982, I was 13. And I did read it and it made a huge impression on me. I can still to this day remember it very clearly, all the story elements. Um, and I enjoyed it and I have a fondness uh, remembering it as well. Thankfully, this was not one of the ones, one of the, the early vintage romances that had what we would refer to as problematic elements. Um, unfortunately, in the 70s and even into the 80s, there was a trope in many of these uh, romances. Oh, I didn't mean to go ahead yet. Uh, there was a trope where it was very common for the seductions to be violent, for them to involve near rape, or in some cases, outright rape. Um, in The Flame and the Flower, for instance, which was the first romance of this type, the first sexual encounter between the uh, main characters is um, a rape essentially based on the fact that the hero believes the heroine's reticence is because uh, she's a prostitute and she's playing a game. So essentially he um, has sex with her against her will. It's not a violent rape, but it's rape nonetheless. So these sort of elements were very, very common. Um, and there were actually ones where it was quite a bit more violent. So that's a whole nother aspect of exploring these vintage romances um, that would probably, that could probably take a whole presentation. There are people probably much more qualified to discuss that than, than I, um, but I just thought I'd mention it. Thankfully, this one that I read, the first one, did not have those elements, um, but some other elements that were uh, not ideal, that were, probably harmful um, in, the, in the early romances and even to a degree today, although much, much less so because there's a great deal more inclusion in the romance scene today, thankfully. Um, in the early romances, 
the main characters, the female, um, the herons were always depicted as um, flawlessly beautiful. And essentially that was what overcame the heroes and made these uh, characters irresistible. So the, the image or rather the message essentially was to have love, to deserve love um, of the alpha hero, so to speak, you had to be flawlessly beautiful, but that was what qualified you um, to have these happily ever after amazing over the top love experiences. And that was certainly the case in A Rose in Winter. And in fact, there was a female antagonist in this story. And the way that the author signaled that she was a, a villain, so to speak, was she was described as being thicker waisted than the heroine and, and not quite as beautiful. So that essentially was code right away to let readers know, oh, there's this is a bad character. She's going to... Um, she's going to be an antagonist. So that was unfortunate. And I think um, I absorbed that idea when I was young for a while in my life that, that somehow flawless beauty was what qualified you for a happily ever after. So I'm very glad that in um, our modern romance uh, scene, there's a great deal more inclusion of um, different body sizes, differently abled, different orientations, um, which is wonderful. However, I still have a fondness for this. It was a great story. Again, very over the top, um, but, but a lot of fun. So there was the good and the bad. And those of us who read these vintage romances, that's essentially our experience as we remember them, um, enjoying them, feeling the the excitement of this new new to us type of storytelling um, at the same time as there were some of these elements um, that were a little problematic okay Okay, moving on to our next illustrator, Robert McGinnis. Robert McGinnis was another um, illustrator who was big in the um, 70s and early to mid 80s. Um, he did what is perhaps the most famous clinch cover right here in the middle, Tender is the Storm. Um, this has been parodied. This has been... Um, made fun of. This has been um, greatly enjoyed. It's hugely collectible. Um, they, these copies of this go on eBay um, for $20. I've even seen it go for as high as almost $50 on eBay. Um, so if you see it somewhere um, at a thrift store or a book sale, I would grab it because this is a highly desirable copy. Um, in later editions, so this came out in 1985, in later editions, because it was sort of scandalous, um, because we have our, our hero here fully nude, they put a um, something over his behind right here. I believe it was some sort of like a little badge or a little medallion. Um, but it is, as, as you look at it, it's pretty ridiculous, but also pretty wonderful. It's just uh, a lot of fun. Robert McGinnis had such a unique style. His, his women were complex. Um, if you look at his work in other genres, he, he illustrated a lot of, of mystery and crime. His women were always very moody. Uh, they had a, a distinctive, elongated look, um, and you, you really can't mistake a Robert McGinnis cover. He did movie posters for James Bond. He did the movie poster for Breakfast at Tiffany's with Audrey Hepburn. Very well um, regarded illustrator. I am actually, he is my favorite uh, romance illustrator, so I am in the process of collecting all of the romance covers that he's done. So I'm well underway, it's a lot of fun. Probably my favorite is this one right here, A Rose in Splendor. 
which I think has a very Gustav Klimt-like quality to it. Um, it's ridiculous, obviously. Um, who wears a rose boa? I mean, for this guy's sake, I hope the, th the thorns have been removed, but it's so ridiculous, it's wonderful. Um, so let's see if there was anything else I wanted to say about him. Um, he's still alive at 95 years old. A very well-regarded illustrator. Elaine, and I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce her last name, but I believe it's Jeanne Um She was also big in the 70s and early 80s. Not so much. You don't see her cover so much mid 80s and beyond. She has such a warm, supple, soft style. It's very distinctive. Um, again, you can see this one from the 70s where uh, the clinch was a little bit smaller and then going into the 80s, it became more prominent. She also paints um, portraits, still lifes and landscapes and she is also still alive. Okay, our next Elaine, Elaine Duillo. Elaine Duillo's covers are electric, they're bold, they're vivid, they're outrageous, they're really glorious. I mean, look at this hair. Nobody does hair like Elaine Duillo. A lot of her covers, the, the heroines just have that hair that basically fills the cover. Um, she retired in 2003, but her heyday in the 80s, she was very prolific, did so many well-recognized, well-loved covers. Um, she began her career in the 50s and was at that time she was illustrating other types of books, uh, adventure stories, gothics, etc. But in the 80s, this is what we got from Elaine Duillo, and they are really stunning. Here we have Fabio. Um, and this is, <laughs> well, what can you say? There's a lot of him here. A lot to see of Fabio. This was one he, he claims was one of his favorite um, illustrations ever. It's a step back and I can actually show you I've got the book right here. So this is the kind of cover that would be on a step back. Um, fairly innocent because, you know, let's face it, it would be a little bit challenging to read, to be reading in public uh, with naked Fabio on the cover. So then you open it and there's, there's the step back. But um, Elaine Duillo had a real affinity for Fabio and, and worked with him a lot. And I'll say more about Fabio in a little bit here, but you'll often see him on her covers, although she did work with other models as well. One thing I haven't said yet is how do you know um, who, who's illustrated a cover? Obviously you can start to recognize styles, but you also wanna know for sure before you attribute something. And I always try to attribute um, the illustrator when I tweet these covers on my um, Twitter account. Often I can find a signature and Elaine Duillo's is usually fairly easy to find. Um, but as I say that on these, it's not, oh, okay, here we go. Um, right up here along the, the man's back, you can see her signature. Um, if I cannot find a signature, often I'll look on the publication page of a book, but it's rare that it's attributed. Although occasionally uh, they will, the publisher will identify the illustrator. So I will either look for the signature, I'll look on the publication page. Um, if, if it's not on the cover, if the signature isn't on the cover, um, occasionally I can do some detective work online um, and find out that way. Sometimes it's a mystery with some illustrators if, if their style is not easily recognizable. Um, a lot of times the illustration, or rather the, the signature on the illustration gets cropped depending on where the artist puts it, or it might even be hidden under the title. Um, but Elaine Duillo did a good job of, of making her signatures visible. She would usually put them along the clothing 
of one of the characters. I don't believe it's visible here, but this is really impossible. It's impossible to miss that that's a Del, um, Elaine Duillo illustration. And in this case, it is actually, and I don't know if you can see, but she is identified on the publication page. So um, that does occasionally happen and it certainly helps. Okay. She had a daughter, Melissa Duillo Gallo. And I believe my little window here is hiding the name. Um, and it's probably not helping. I'm trying to move my window, but I don't think it's gonna move in the recording. But it's G-A-L-L-O, Melissa Duillo Gallo. So her style is very much like her mother's to the degree that um, they can be confused occasionally if you can't find her signature. Um, in this case, you can see Gallo, the signature is right down here. Um, there were some notable differences between mother and daughter. First of all, Melissa Duillo Gallo learned from her mother. She did not have any formal art training right out of high school. She began working with her mother um, and, and learned and got into the business. One of the big differences, which is fascinating, um, is that Melissa Duillo Gallo refused to do the nudity. She was asked by the publisher and she refused to do it. She said, I have young children. And she was upset with her mother when her mother agreed to do um, the cover like I just showed you with Fabio. And she did some other uh, nudes in profile as well on other covers and step backs. Um, Melissa refused and did not uh, agree with her mother uh, for doing that. She was never, Melissa Duilo Gallo was never really at home you know, doing the romance covers. It wasn't what she wanted to be doing. She was more interested in the craft element of art. She wanted to be working with clay, with fabric, with wax. Um, and I, she is no longer illustrating. Um, this all, by the way, all this information I got in a 1994 article about her, and I will provide the link to that at the end of this presentation. Okay, going on to Pino, Pino Deani, I believe is how he pronounce his name. He is generally known simply as Pino. And most of the time you can find his signature. So you can see it right here. There's the Pino. Uh, on this book, there was no signature, but he, I remember he was credited on the publication page for that. I'm not sure if, if his signature is visible here, but he's generally very recognized. Um, Pino came from Italy. Um, I believe he was born in Milan. He came to New York in 1978. And um, immediately got into romance illustration. He was probably the most prolific illustrator um, in his time as an illustrator, largely in the 80s and into the early 90s. He did probably over 3,000 book covers. He could do a cover illustration in a day, whereas it took other illustrators weeks to a month to create an illustration the way they wanted. He was just um, incredibly prolific, very talented. Um, he mentored other illustrators. In fact, I'll show you one that he mentored here momentarily. Um, he did do other things other than romance, especially in the early days. He did some movie posters and magazine illustrations, but largely was, was doing the romances. He got out of it in the early to mid 90s and focused on his fine art, um, which was uh, more of an impressionistic style. A lot of the illustrators at a certain point in their careers did choose to leave illustration and work in the fine arts. Not all of them, but, but several of them did and Pino was one of them. Sharon Spiak, I thought she would be fun to include because I know that for class, you're reading The Pirate and the Pagan, um, which she illustrated. Um, she did others as well. She was an apprentice to Pino. So here is a, a case of, um, of Pino um, spreading his knowledge and his talent to another generation of illustrator. She began illustrating, illustrating in the 80s. 
Um, and she still illustrates fashion. She does pet paintings, but she no longer does book covers as far as I was able to research. Um, by the way, The Pirate and the Pagan, with this particular cover, is highly collectible. Um, one just sold recently on eBay for about $28. So if you come across one of these original covers, it might be worth grabbing. John Ennis. Um, I don't know if I'm pronounce, pronouncing it correctly, his last name. Oh, and the same thing with Pino. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Hold on. Going back to Pino Dayani, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, his full name, by the way, is um, D'Angelico, Pino Dayani D'Angelico, but I believe when he came to the U.S., he was simply Pino Dayani, mostly just known as Pino. Okay, so John Ennis, I'm going to pronounce it that way until I learn differently. Um, he, he no longer does book covers. He's currently a portrait painter, but he did start with covers in the 80s, and he had just such a lovely style, um, painted in oils. I love the way he does these curly Q hair uh, paintings. Even the hair here on this guy. I just, it's just such a distinctive style. He helped usher in the era of, of uh, going digital. So as you can see, these covers are from the 80s. This one is from the early 2000s, and it still has his look to it, but you can see it's much different. It has a much different quality, and that's because he made the, the switch to digital. And in fact, he authored a book called Going Digital, An Artist's Guide to Computer Illustration. So interestingly, shortly after he sort of pioneered this, this uh, move into digital illustration, he left the field of illustration and returned to oil painting as a fine artist. So I think what happened for some of these illustrators is even though they, they knew they had to move into this new era of illustration, it wasn't where their hearts were. They really enjoyed the old fashioned um, use of oils and acrylics and eventually went back to that. Um, in fact, our next illustrator, James Griffin, is still an illustrator. He still illustrates romance. He began in, in 1976, um, worked throughout the 80s, um, into the 2000s and is still working at it to this day, although now he's almost exclusively um, digital. But he will state that his first love, his, his first love is these, his oil um, painted illustrations. Um, there is a, an interview with him that was just posted um, by somebody in the romance community. I met her on Twitter through my account. And she has a website, romanceruminations.net. Um, I would very much recommend checking out the interview with James Griffin because he talks about uh, his experience working from the early days into the current days. He talks about the experience of working with authors and publishers and making choices um, for creating the look of a cover, working with the models. And he does not call them models. He calls them actors um, because they, he, he needed them to actually take on these characteristics. So it's a wonderful interview, very insightful about the experience of being an illustrator through these decades in the romance industry. And the final illustrator I'm going to share is Max Ginsburg. He's another one um, who he entered the art world in the 60s. He's a representational artist. And in the 60s, it was all about abstraction. It was about minimalism. And that just wasn't who he was. That wasn't what he enjoyed. Um, so he got into commercial art simply as a way to make a living because, you know, everybody needs to eat, right? So he, he chose to do that and worked in many genres in addition to, to romance. He also left commercial art in 2004 and is, is a fine artist. Um, he's actually, he's won a lot of awards. He is in major galleries and the permanent collections of major galleries. Um, so a very well regarded 
Illustrator, and you can see these are just beautiful. Um, this is the back of a book. So occasionally in the 90s, you didn't have the clinch on the cover. You would have it either in the step back or on the back. Um, but they're just, they're, they're such a, a, a soft, almost impressionistic quality to his work at the same time as it's representational. All right, so that's it for our illustrators. Briefly, let's talk about some models. We have our three long-haired muscle men of romance covers. There were many other models and their names are known, um, but I just thought it would be fun to share a few of them. Um, and of course, we have to talk about Fabio because there was nobody quite like Fabio. Fabio has name recognition outside of the romance community. In fact, the name Fabio, probably more than any other author, model, or, or any personality in romance, he is probably the one name known um, outside, known widely outside the romance community. Um, I know somebody who met him, and evidently he's just, he was just a a really pleasant person, um, has had great charisma, had great um, personable qualities, personable interaction, and he knew how to play to his fame. So Fabio is just, he's an icon for a reason. Um, here's a cover, Lane DeWillow, as I said earlier, she had a real affinity for working with Fabio. Um, and he, he was painted probably by all of the major illustrators, but particularly Elaine DeWillow captured, um, captured his, his look. I am going to go out onto the internet. So give me just a moment. I have to do a new screen share. There are no pictures of Fabio that are rights cleared. Oh, I take that back. This one, so this is Fabio now. He's a little bit older. This one was rights cleared, but I wanted to, to show some photos of him um, in his heyday. So here we go. Here's Fabio um, at his peak in real life. He did commercials for I can't believe. Oh, excuse me, just a moment. I apologize, my phone is ringing. Let me pause this recording. All right, I apologize for that. Some real world intrusion there into my presentation. Okay, so there's Fabio. Um, let's go on now to Steve Sandalis. Steve Sandalis um, was uh, hired by a publisher, Topaz, uh, and he became Topaz Man. So they used him. Here we have uh, we have Steve with his shirt coming off. He became their little logo on the spines of their books. He was used on a lot of covers. And I believe they were hoping he would become as big as Fabio, which he, he didn't. Um, but he did have some, obviously, uh, he was he was well known and had some contracts outside of just book covers. So again, I'm going to take you to the internet just to see some some other pictures of him in real life. Give me just a moment to switch my screen sharing. Here we go. Okay, so here's Steve Sandalis. He had a calendar. He was on Playgirl. <laughs> so, so he got some exposure, uh, so to speak. Here's, um, here's him with short hair, um, which isn't quite as impressive as him with long hair. All right. So back to the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, our final long-haired muscle man of clinch covers is John DeSalvo. Here he is on a step back, um, a book for Virginia Henley called Unmasked. And he's very recognizable. Let's go take a quick look at him on the internet. Give me just a minute to switch my screen share.
And here is John DeSalvo. So if you look at the covers of the vintage uh, clinch covers, you'll very often see either Fabio, John DeSalvo, or Steve Sandalis, particularly if they are long haired. Um, but again, by no means the, uh, the only models, there were other models and their names were known and they had some celebrity because of it. Um, let me fix, go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, a few fun elements. All right, here's a game I like to call Who Wore It Better? And this is a situation of, of a little bit of a mystery. When I posted this cover right here on my Twitter account, I did not credit uh, an illustrator because I couldn't find one. But another uh, person on Twitter discovered that it is in fact, there is a signature that I did not spot and it's Jean. However, neither of us and it was me and then this uh, right here, Jay Diaz Romance. She has a, a blog on um, and has a Twitter account and reviews a lot of the vintage romances. Neither of us could find out any additional information about Jean. So Jean is a complete mystery. We don't know if it's a man. We don't know if it's a woman. Um, and uh, Jacqueline Diaz, Jay Diaz Romance, shared this cover, also illustrated by the mysterious Jean. She shared this a couple days later. And then another person on Twitter said, hey, she's wearing the same dress as, as the cover that I had shared a couple of days earlier. So this is a, a fun situation of who wore it better. Uh, and you can find these kinds of fun things with other illustrators as well. Elaine DeWillo often had her models wear um, similar costumes. So you can play who wore it better with um, Elaine Duillo covers. Uh, and a lot of times it's, it's possible that these came from the same photo shoot. We don't know. It doesn't look like these are the same models. So it could be that Jean simply had this dress um, that she had different models wear at different times. We don't know, but it's kind of fun. Okay. Animals of the clinch. Uh, some people like to play a game of I spy with animals on clinch covers. So here we have a kitty um, who is not at all impressed with whatever these folks are doing here in the field. Uh, we have a bunny rabbit. Hopefully he, she, it won't get kicked. Um, and then we have a voyeuristic deer who's <laughs> who seems very intent on watching whatever it is these, this couple is doing in their little ice cave. A uh, little bit worried that she's going to catch cold there. Her chest is slightly exposed. Um, and here we have poor little puppy dog who probably wants to be somewhere else while these folks are getting it on. Um, there are many, many other animals on clinch covers. There are there's there's unicorns. Um, lots of birds, swans, um, oh, horses. Horses are everywhere on clinch covers. Um, symbols of virility, um, of spirit, of energy. So um, just some fun with clinches. Aha, and then seeing double. So here, this is similar to who wore it better. Although in this case, we have the exact same models, both uh, man and woman slightly different positions. Um, and she's actually wearing a different dress. So it could have been, it, well, it, it probably was the same photo shoot, very possibly. And also very possible that when you are out and about in the wild, you could find a third or even a fourth cover with these people in a similar position. Um, oh, I haven't talked about this yet. This is a hologram. So on Zebra Books, Zebra was a publisher um, in the 80s, very big in the 80s and into the 90s. And I, it's possible Zebra still exists in some form. But in the 80s, they put holograms on their covers. And as a result, their sales increased by about 50%. Um, evidently, it was, a, it, it was a way to catch the eye of 
of women, particularly mothers in line at grocery store, at a grocery store, um, almost like a fishing lure, just, just to catch their attention, and it worked. Um, zebra books were interesting in that the zebra was known as not having always the greatest quality of editing. I mean, they took on authors that other publishers rejected. Um, but nevertheless, they, they, they did very well. People collect their covers. Um, okay, so we are at the point where I do have to provide a content warning. These are covers that I will not share on my account. Um, again, my Twitter account is about fun. It's about enjoying um, what we're seeing. In some cases, making fun of it. And these covers are simply racist. Um, there is cultural, a cultural appropriation. There's no connection to the actual people. Neither the author nor the models uh, were people from the culture that it represents, Native American. Um, and the, there were references in titles to stereotypes such as savage. Um, and, and in many cases, these were just very hurtful. I particularly came to the decision not to share them um, when earlier uh, this year, the stories came out about the children in Canada, the, the um, indigenous children who they, they found them in mass graves at schools where they had been sent to have their culture essentially stripped from them. Um, so for me to then share images of a, of a culture, not even accurate images, uh, when the actual people from that culture are having it stripped from them, it just strikes, strikes me as, as just highly immoral. So I do believe there's a place for these. Um, obviously, that they sh I do not believe such content should be published. The, the books that were published in the 80s and 90s, there's a place for them. They need to be preserved and in some cases studied because it is a part of, of romance history, an unfortunate part, and it, it needs to be um, put in context just as the romances with the problematic elements like um, rape and abuse. So, so again, we'll just look at these briefly. Um, and as I said, these, the models, these were white men. These were not indigenous men. Um, and who knows if they were, if the, the costuming was accurate to whichever tribe they supposedly belonged to. Instances of, of savage in the title. Um, unfortunately, these are still in print, obviously not with these covers, but um, there is some distress on the part of, of many people that these are still in print and enjoyed, um, but it's, uh, I, I believe, very harmful to the people who belong to these cultures. Okay, so a palate cleanser now. This is Beverly Jenkins. Beverly Jenkins is a wonderful author. She's active on Twitter, just a lovely person. Um, she was the first African-American author in the early 90s with this book right here, Night Song, published in 1994. She was the first African-American author to write and publish one of the big historicals um, of this type and to have a clinch cover with African-American characters. Um, she does not know who the illustrators were. I asked her for these covers. She couldn't remember the illustrators. However, she, the model right here, his name is Kendall McCarthy. And she said he was a, a lovely man who actually attended her first book signing for this book, Night Song. And she said the women who had come to see her totally ignored her at that point and were only interested in, in him um, because he was such an attractive, obviously um, such an attractive man. Um, this, any of these, these three books, by the way, highly collectible. This one recently sold, a first printing here sold on eBay for about $66. 
Um, this one goes even higher just because it's, it's so beautiful with the colors. Um, Vivid, um, occasionally you can get a good deal um, on Vivid, but these are just wonderful examples of, of how uplifting it can be, how, how fun and uplifting and affirming um, and inclusive these covers truly can be. Okay, we're winding down now. I'm gonna, just gonna say a few words about collecting. I've already mentioned that some of these books are highly collectible and can go for quite a bit of money um, on, on the secondary market. You might enjoy hunting for them in the wild, so to speak. When I uh, talk about the wild, essentially I mean thrift stores. I, I go to Salvation Army thrift store a lot. You could go to Goodwill. Um, there's other uh, thrift stores, I'm sure. Library book sales, your big tent library book sales are great places to find, uh, to scout for romances. You might pay 50 cents, you might pay a dollar, um, but when you're able to turn around and, and resell it for $20 or over, it can be uh, a little bit heady. Um, but it's also fun just to collect just for your own interest. There does not have to be any financial motivation. Um, if you are called to do it, there are good reasons to collect. Obviously, it can be fun and rewarding just for your own interest. However, collecting actually creates and affirms value beyond um, individual enjoyment. The things that are collected get preserved. Things that get preserved get studied. Uh, these books were not particularly designed to last Okay, the, they're paperback, they get beat up very easily. And already, romances that were published in the 70s are becoming scarce. And as they become scarce, people don't have access to them. So that time in history uh, potentially could become lost. So there are good reasons to, to collect in addition to personal interest. Um, and the romance, romances, the history of romance is one of the most dynamic um, and reflective of what's going on in culture, what's going on in the inner lives of women. Um, these are all things that are, that are well worth uh, remembering, studying, putting into context. So collecting is important and it's, it's actually gaining in, in popularity. There's been an increase in scholarly attention to the romance genre. So these are all wonderful things. Um, but in terms of who anybody can collect and you can collect anybody, any author, what you get to decide your criteria. Um, some people like to be completist. They like to collect everything from one author. Or in my case, I'm collecting or in the process of collecting everything, all the romances illustrated by Robert McGinnis. Um, there's really no wrong or, or right way to do it. You could also collect randomly. Um, whatever you see, if it's a clinch cover, um, that's sort of what I'm also currently doing, but I will not be keeping them all. Um, for instance, so with my with the, the covers, the Indian covers that I just showed you, um, I will currently, my plan is to, to give those to a woman who's actually building a collection that she intends to then give to an institution. And I really think that is the appropriate place for, for covers like that, um, where they can be put into an appropriate context, they can be studied. Um, so, so that's my plan. Um, with others, I'll probably sell them. Um, I could sell them in, in groups, in lots, or, or give them to people. I pick up a lot of these, I get them for free because people leave them at free book exchanges. Um, so, but I, I won't keep them obviously because they're already sort of overflowing my bookshelves. Okay, when, Wh whenever? You know, you never know. I find books um, on shelves outside of drugstores. People have little set up little book exchanges where they just leave books for free. Um, so that's the when and the where. And I've already spoken about the why. Um, so briefly, because this recording, this presentation is getting a little bit long, I do want to take you to eBay and show you a few things to, to look for. 
Um, and this is not a promotion for eBay. Uh, you're certainly, you don't ever have to buy from eBay or sell, but it's a good way to, to research the market value, what people are asking for certain titles and what people are willing to pay. Um, and there's also a few elements that I wanna show you for how to identify printings, first editions, et cetera. So um, let me go ahead, I'm going to pull up the internet and then give me just a moment to adjust to the new screen share. All right, um, so, and I'm also gonna give you some other titles and authors to look out for that are particularly collectible and particularly valuable, um, just because it's fun to, to get something that you can then, you either know is valuable or you can uh, resell it. Oh, there was one, oh, I need to, mm. I've already pulled up eBay. Let me get another, another screen here because this I definitely wanted to show you this give me just a moment okay let me make sure that this is i want to share this okay so here is a very collectible book that you wanna keep your eyes open for. Christina Dodd wrote Castles in the Air and it was published in 93. It was illustrated by Robert McGuire, um, but for whatever reason, he did not catch that the lady here has three arms. So the famous three-armed lady of Castles in the Air very collectible goes i think one one i saw one go on ebay uh, a while ago for well over 50 dollars all right back to ebay let me make sure i'm sharing the right screen okay let's take a look at tender is the storm by joanna lindsay So here we have one currently for sale. This, however, is the one, I, I don't know if you remember, I said there was a badge put over his behind. So this is not a print, this is not a first printing. Um, this is a later printing. Already somebody's bid on it for $5. What I like to do is go and look at the sold listings. Because if you look at the sold listings, that gives you an idea of what people are willing to pay because anybody can put any price on a book, but what counts is the price that's actually realized. So here we have copy a copy of the book club edition that goes for about $25. Now book club editions, they're the hardcover with the dust jacket. Some people prefer collecting those. I do not, um, and there's no right or wrong but I like to get, if possible, the first appearance of something. And that's usually going to be either the first trade edition or the first mass market edition. Um, and let's see if I can find one here. Here's another book club edition, book club edition. Here again with the badge over the butt. Here is, now this one I'm pretty sure is a first edition. So let's go take a look. So this one actually, boy, somebody got a pretty good deal on that. They got it for $10 and 50 cents. Um, not in the greatest of condition, but still that's not bad. Even I've even seen copies of this beat up to this degree that have gone for over $20. So somebody here got a pretty good deal, but this one does not have a picture of the publication page, which is what I wanted to show you. So let's go take a look excuse me, let's go take a look at another listing. Okay, this one, this one went for $27. And here is a, a 
copy or rather a, a picture of the publication page. Let me get it. So this is how you determine if something is a first printing. You have to see if, if there's a number line. And in this case, there is. And what you want to see in the number line is the number one. And in this case, we are indeed seeing that there's the number one, which indicates it's a first printing. If the number line had 10, 9, 8, 7, that would indicate it's the seventh printing. Whatever the lowest number is on the number line, that's the number of the printing. All right. Let me give you an example of your Pirate and the Pagan. Okay, here's one sold for $26. Okay, that sold relatively recently. And we'll take a look. So that is the original cover. However, in looking at the publication page, it is a seventh printing because the number line, the lowest number is a seven. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it just depends on your criteria. Some people, they just really only care about the cover. Uh, I would, if it had been me, I would have wanted the, the one in the number line, but that is simply my preference. All right, so I am going to close eBay here. I'm gonna stop sharing eBay and go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm gonna quickly give you some other titles that I know are desirable, that, that are uh, collectible. Um, anything by Teresa Dennis, D-E-N-Y-S, Teresa Dennis. She um, published two novels in her lifetime, The Silver Devil and The Flesh and the Devil. She died uh, an untimely death, I believe. But The Silver Devil and The Flesh and the Devil, they were published in the late 70s, early 80s. And they have what we would now call problematic storylines with, with a lot of um, violence, sort of a sad, sadistic type of hero. Um, however, the covers are wonderful and they go for a hundred or more dollars um, resale. Uh, let's see, but anything that the Beverly Jenkins books that I pointed out and Lisa, and I think it's pronounced Klepas, K-L-E-Y-P-A-S, she's still, publishing. She's a, she's a popular author, but her early clinch covers and her step backs are wildly collectible. Some people have paid near a hundred dollars. Um, so excuse me, forever. My love dreaming of you give me tonight, midnight angel where passion leads. Then came you because you're mine. All of those titles have recently sold on eBay for upwards of $20, sometimes as high as $100. So just some ideas of authors to be looking for um, if, if you're doing a little treasure hunting. Um, but certainly monetary value is, is just one of, of the elements to collect. Fun is probably the best one. No right or wrong reason to do it. A books. I did want to point out that abooks.com is another uh, great source for collecting, although they don't always have pictures. And it's a good idea if you're going to be spending money to actually see pictures of what it is that you're going to be purchasing. Um, I have that issue with Amazon as well. Um, so if anybody wants to contact me, if you have questions about anything I've shared, Questions, comments, you're certainly welcome um, to get in touch with me. Let me go back to my original slide here. Um, has to be a quicker way to do this, but okay, fine. We'll go, <laughs> go back through them. Um, feel free to get in touch with me through my website. Here's my email address. And of course, I would be delighted to have you contact me through Twitter at Art of the Clinch. 
All right. Uh, my uh, wish for you is that you enjoy romance. Thank you so much.